Okay. Um, we should be starting to go live. I think we're waiting on two more channels to start. Um, but I'm going to get my share screen set up. Uh, yes, I know the meeting is being live streamed Zoom. I did that. Um, oh, and I'm also going to turn on our transcriptions. Um, okay. Um, oh, where is share screen? It's not like, oh, there it is. It's right in the middle. It's a different color than everything else. <laughs> okay. Um, so for those just joining us, um, my name is Sage Michaels. I'm a live events volunteer with SASA, and hopefully you all are seeing my um, shared screen right now. So um, it is not starting on the right page. <laughs> there we go. Um, today we'll be talking about Lovecraft with S.T. Joshi, who's written books on Lovecraft. It'll be hosted by my wonderful SASA volunteer, Jackson Reinhardt. So what is SASA? SASA save, stands for Save Ancient Studies Alliance. Um, our mission is to reverse the current downward trend in the study of the ancient world uh, uh, by engaging the public through events um, such as this. Um, so this uh, past few weeks and leading into the start of November, we are having our Halloween bash, which includes events such as this one, as well as we have four more events, all of which you need to RSVP for as their private Zoom events. And you can do that by going to saveancientstudies.org slash Halloween bash. Um, so you can also find SASA uh, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, uh, Discord. I think we're also on like LinkedIn. We're everywhere. So you can just search Save Ancient Studies and we should pop up. Um, kind of some guidelines for today's event. Please be kind and respectful. Uh, please, please send in your questions throughout the event. Uh, we'd love to answer any questions you have. Uh, please be patient with technology and those administering it. This is my uh, first time being the one is administering our live streaming. And so far, it seems to be working. So uh, fingers crossed that continues. Uh, our live events are streamed on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. And the recordings will be archived and posted on the platforms above. So if you had a friend or family member who couldn't make it currently, they can go watch the recording. And most important, have fun and thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna pass it over to Jackson Reinhardt to introduce the topic for today's um, event. Great, thank you so much, Sage. Uh, so as said, my name is Jackson Reinhardt. I'm a communications intern and volunteer here at SASA. And I'm very honored today uh, to be introducing our speaker, S.T. Joshi, who's a leading authority on H.P. Lovecraft, Ambrose Bierce, H.L. Mencken, among other prestigious writers, mostly in the realm of supernatural, fantasy, and weird fiction. He has edited corrected, corrected editions of the works of Lovecraft, several annotated editions of Bierce and Mencken, and has written such critical studies as The Weird Tale, 1990, and The Modern Weird Tale, 2001. His award-winning biography, H.P. Lovecraft, The Life, 1996, was expanded and updated into I Am Providence, The Life and Times of H.P. Lovecraft, which was published in two volumes in 2010. Joshi's multitudinous studies, biographies, bibliographies, and edited volumes have been published by Penguin, Library of America, Prometheus Books, and various university presses. S.T. Joshi will be speaking to us today for a little under an hour on the influence and relationship of the ancient world upon the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft, among other weird authors. Hopefully, if time willing, there will be a few questions and answers at lecture's end. S.T., please take it away. Glad to be here. Um, I suppose I was chosen for this talk, not only because I am a, an expert on Lovecraft, but because I'm one of the relatively few 
individuals in the Lovecraft field who has some knowledge of, of uh, classical civilization, the classical world. Um, it has meant a lot to me. And I, I may get into that later on, but chiefly I want to talk about some of these writers that I've been dealing with who also exhibited uh, an interest in the classics. Um, now, of course, we're dealing with a time roughly late 19th into the, uh, into the 20th century where the study of, of classical uh, culture was much more predominant in schools than it is now. And I hope that uh, organizations like this help to, to reverse that trend because I'll tell you, it's, a, it's an extremely rewarding field. But, but so it is understandable that a lot of the writers, not just the weird writers uh, that I'd be talking about, but any writers would be uh, uh, affected and, and influenced by, by classical civilization. They, they refer to things all the time in their work. Um, but the two writers that I wanna talk about first before getting to Lovecraft, uh, are those who both influenced Lovecraft and themselves exhibited uh, an interest uh, uh, in, in classics uh, in, in, in distinctive ways. The first writer I want to talk about is Arthur Macken, uh, M-A-C-H-E-N. He was a Welsh writer, uh, born 1863, died 1947, a long-lived uh, life. Um, there are two important things you need to know about Macken, and that is one, he was born in the town of Kerlian on Usk in southeastern Wales. This was, in, in Roman times, uh, the city of Isca Silurum, where the, the um, uh, Second Augustan Legion was based. Uh, uh, and indeed, there are tremendous uh, Roman ruins right in that city. I've been there a long time ago, three or four decades ago, I was there. Um, uh, and there's a tremendous, tremendous uh, remains there. There's a huge amphitheater uh, uh, right outside the city. It's actually covered by grass and, and turf, at least at the time I was there. Uh, but you can see this huge bowl-like depression there where the amphitheater used to be. So this is where Mackin grew up. He had the, these, these uh, tokens of, of uh, uh, Roman civilization all around him. And so he became fascinated with uh, the Roman presence uh, in Britain. Um, and at the same time, the second thing about Mackin that you need to know is that he was devoutly uh, religious. Uh, he became an Anglo-Catholic um, and, and really uh, 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 sort of uh, pioneered that, uh, that, that view in, in a lot of his work. I mean, his work is infused with, with religious belief. And so as he developed as a writer, he developed a kind of ambiguity, a, 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 a complexity in his uh, approach uh, to ancient civilization. He was fascinated by it because it was right there. And yet, because it was pre-Christian and in some cases anti-Christian, he regarded it with a certain kind of suspicion. And this, this ambivalence comes out, especially in a, in a work that he wrote early in life called uh, The Great God Pan. Uh, this was published in 1894. Um, he had gone to London and, and established himself as a journalist uh, and wrote this uh, slim little book called The Great God Pan and caused quite a controversy in his day. The Great God Pan uh, talks about a scientist who conducts some kind of experiment. <laughs> we don't know exactly how he's making, he's very vague about this, uh, upon a, his own servant woman uh, named Mary, uh, in which she sees Pan. Now, what does that mean? Well, we are led to believe, although it's, they say, extremely indirect, that, that somehow Pan gets summoned out of the, out of the ether uh, and mates with, with uh, Mary. She eventually dies, but she apparently uh, brings forth a child. 20 years later, uh, a young woman named Helen Vaughan shows up in London society and causes all kinds of ruckus. You know, men commit suicide after meeting her and things like that. And uh, let's just say she does not end well. Um, it is a really a, a fine horror story. I mean, it, it has some problems with it, uh, structurally speaking, but it, 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 it had a tremendous impact. And it does show this tremendous uh, uh, ambivalence in Mackin's uh, um, interest in, in, in the classics. On the one hand, uh, there's the fascination of this pre-Christian culture. And on the other hand, uh, uh, it, it's really a heretical culture, isn't it, from the Christian point of view. So uh, that, that ambivalence comes out very powerfully in that story. There's another work that I want to point out, and that is the novel, The Hill of Dreams. This is a, a beautiful, beautiful piece of work published in 1907, although it was written actually a decade earlier. Very autobiographical story. Um, about a Welsh writer, a Welsh person named Lucian Taylor, who goes to London, uh, just like Mackin, tries to be a writer, and again, has a difficult time of it, shall we say, and, and he also does not end well. Uh, but the, there's one entire long chapter, 
chapter four of this work in which Taylor has some sort of dream, hallucination, fantasy, we don't know exactly what, of being back in Roman Britain in the town of Isca Silurum. Uh, and he spends days and weeks there uh, living as a, 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 a provincial Roman in, in that city. It, it's really a remarkable instance of, of the historical imagination. And, and Mack had just dredged up everything he knew about Roman Britain and, 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 and then the culture of his town. And it's, it's really a vital piece of writing. Um, the Hill of Dreams is not really a weird tale, but it's a it's a powerful, powerful work about about the difficulty of aesthetic expression. In fact, Mackin himself, I'm not sure if it's in that novel or in some other works. He wrote a famous sentence. He said about about the difficulty of writing. He says he dreamed in fire, but he wrote in clay. And, and I think he felt that about himself. He felt he couldn't get his own impressions down on paper the way they, that he felt them deep inside. And this novel is an expression of that, of that view. So that's Matt Mark, Mark, Arthur Mackin. I want to talk about another writer who influenced Lovecraft, and that is Lord Dunsany. Lord Dunsany was indeed a nobleman. He was an Irish peer. He became the 18th Baron Dunsany uh, in 1899 upon the death of his father. And I'll tell you, uh, there is still a Dunsany Castle out in Ireland, uh, just uh, sort of northeast of Dublin. I've been there a couple of times, um, built in the late 12th century uh, and, and still going and been renovated since then. In fact, uh, <laughs> the, the Dowager Lady Dunsany once told me, you know, if you want to renovate a castle, the best time to do it was the 18th century. <laughs> so apparently that happened. Uh, but the writer, Lord Dunsany, born 1878, died 1937. Early in his life, he seemed to be just sort of an idle aristocrat, not really interested in doing anything. Um, but uh, in 1904, for whatever reason, he sat down and wrote a little book called The Gods of Pegana. We actually don't know if it's pronounced Pegana or Pagana or something else, but I, I tend to say Pegana. Anyway, this book, uh, he actually had to pay for the publication of this book because he was not an established writer, and, and, but it created kind of a sensation when it came out in 1905. Uh, and the next year he published a, a follow-up volume called Time and the Gods. Now these two volumes create an entire pantheon of gods and goddesses and, and, and demigods, worshipers, all set in this imaginary realm called Pagana. And there's no question that, Mac, that Dunsany drew upon his own uh, uh, learning of the classics uh, for this work. In fact, he actually says so in, in, in his autobiography, Patches of Sunlight. He tells about how he uh, uh, received schooling at Eton and then at Sandhurst. Uh, Sandhurst was a, a preparatory school for, for boys, mostly of the uh, titled nobility, especially those who were going into the military. And in fact, Dunsany later did uh, serve in the Boer War and then in the uh, World War I. But he says, well, I didn't quite master Greek well enough. Uh, it was just too tough for me. And so he says that that inability, he says, left me with a curious longing for the mighty lore of the Greeks, of which I had had glimpses like a child seeing wonderful flowers through the shut gates of a garden. And it may have been the retirement of the Greek gods from my vision after I left Eton that eventually drove me to satisfy some such longing, my making gods unto myself as I did in my first two books. So there's a clear testament to how, how the, the Greek culture, or in some senses, the absence of Greek culture uh, inspired him to create his own gods in, in the manner of, of uh, Greek myth. If you read these two works, they are full of allusions to, to uh, uh, things out of Greek literature and Greek mythology. Uh, there's a story called In the Land of Time, in which an army uh, cries, Alata, Alata, as if referring to some imaginary realm. Now, that's clearly a reference to uh, Xenophon's and Abbasis, uh, when, when the, the Greeks trying to escape from Persia finally reach uh, the seashore and cry, Thalata, Thalata, the sea, the sea. There's another passage in, in a story called The Vengeance of Men. I'll quote it. All feared the pestilence, and those that he smote beheld them. But none saw the great shapes of the gods by starlight as they urged their pestilence on. Now, to my mind, that is a clear echo of book two of Virgil's Aeneid, where uh, uh, Venus 
takes Aeneas through through the, the, the town of Troy, that it's, it's being overwhelmed by the gods. Uh, but you can't see the gods unless uh, uh, a god shows you their presence. They are invisible to normal human beings. Uh, uh, and, 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 and Dunsany is clearly referring to that sort of thing. There are other instances, many other instances, uh, where Dunsany uh, uh, alludes to um, uh, Greek and Roman myth uh, in his work. So now that brings us to, to Mr. Lovecraft. Howard Phillips Lovecraft, born 1890, died 1937. Um, lived most of his life in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, would have liked to attend Brown University, but didn't get the chance for reasons I won't go into. Um, we know more about Lovecraft than almost any human being in history, I think, <laughs> largely because of the existence of thousands and thousands of his personal letters that he wrote to family or friends or other writers or whatever. whatever. They really provide a, a true glimpse into his mind, just like the letters of Pliny, the younger Pliny or, or, or Cicero, uh, even more so. In fact, he talks about his life. He talks about his writings. He talks about his philosophy, his uh, point of view, his travels, uh, and especially his childhood. And it's from these letters that we learn how early on uh, uh, his interest in Greek myth developed. Around the age of six, um, he started reading uh, children's books, particularly Nathaniel Hawthorne's um, Tanglewood Tales and A Wonder Book, and also, in particular, uh, Thomas Bullfinch's The Age of Fable. Now, if you haven't read those books, you really ought to. They are some of the most delightful recountings of Greek uh, myth that you will ever find. They are still really, really uh, uh, enrapturing today, and Lovecraft was totally enraptured by them. Um, in fact, he, <laughs> he claimed that after reading these books, he, he, he became a kind of a uh, uh, sincere pagan himself. Um, let me read what he says in an essay. When about seven or eight, I was a genuine pagan so intoxicated with the beauty of Greece that I acquired a half sincere belief in the old gods and nature spirits. I have in literal truth built altars to Pan, Apollo, Diana, and Athena, and have watched for dryads and satyrs in the woods and fields at dusk. Once I firmly thought I beheld some of these sylvan creatures dancing under autumnal oaks, a kind of religious experience as true in its way as, this, as the subjective ecstasies of any Christian. If a Christian tell me that he has felt the reality of his Jesus or Yahweh, I can reply that I have seen the hoofed pan and the sisters of the Hesperian Phaethusa. It's fascinating. Um, left I've read uh, uh, tried to read some uh, uh, ancient literature, but mostly at, at the start, anyway, he started reading translations and some of the great classic translations uh, of, of Greek and, and Latin literature. One work in particular he read was something called Garth's Ovid. Now, Garth's Ovid was uh, a, a translation in verse uh, of, of Ovid's Metamorphoses uh, assembled by Samuel Garth in the early, uh, early 18th century. I think it was published 1706. Uh, and he got some of the great poets of the day, uh, you know, like Dryden and um, Pope and, and Joseph Addison to contribute to this book. It was the a complete translation of the 15 books of the, of the Metamorphoses. And Lovecraft just ate that up. It was fascinating. He did eventually uh, learn the ancient languages. In fact, quite early on, he says, though, that Greek was tough for him. He says, I, I never got past the six, first six books of Xenophon, um, by which I assume he means the Anabasis, um, which is probably what he would have been given in school. I believe he read or learned Latin on his own uh, at the age of like eight or nine, because we have in existence a short work that he wrote called Ovid's Metamorphoses. Now, what is this? Ovid's Metamorphoses, he probably wrote about the age of 10, I'm not sure, but around the age of 10, is nothing more than a verse translation in English of the first 70, 80 lines of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Uh, it's really a, a pretty amazing piece of work. And if you actually compare it to God's Ovid, there's actually, he didn't derive it from there. He translated himself by heaven. Uh, really a, a major accomplishment. Uh, in fact, I think Lovecraft responded more to, to Latin or Roman culture uh, than to Greek. It, it was closer to him for a number of reasons, um, partially because his grandfather who was a, a businessman and widely traveled. Um, brought back uh, actual artifacts from Rome, uh, statuettes, coins, whatever, and so he could actually uh, handle these things uh, in, in, in person. Uh, in fact, he, <laughs> he says at one point in a letter, at the age of seven, I sported the adopted name of Lucius Valerius Masala and tortured imaginary Christians in amphitheaters. Oops, sorry. 
I'm sure he didn't mean that. He was just kidding. Uh, but he wasn't kidding when he wrote late in life. To me, the Roman Empire will always seem the central incident of human history. Uh, so Rome meant a lot to him. Um, Lovecraft did all this writing early on. He, uh, I forgot to mention this. Po the earliest surviving literary work was called The Poem of Ulysses. He wrote it when he was like seven years old, uh, which is like a paraphrase in 88 lines of the entire Odyssey. It's a really kind of amazing feat of compression. Uh, not a bad poem for a seven-year-old, but he began seriously writing in the 1910s. Around 1914, he joined a movement called Amateur Journalism. Now, what that is... Uh, there were about two or 300 people around the country who gathered into various uh, formal groups of amateur journalists who wrote and printed their own little magazines, uh, not for money, of course, it was amateur, uh, just for the love of it. Um, it was a way to get practice in writing uh, and also practice in printing. A lot of these people had their own little print, print, uh, printing machines and, and wanted to sort of see how well they could print uh, little magazines. Lovecraft contributed a lot to these, uh, to these amateur journals for the next several years. Uh, one of the things he wrote uh, was a piece called The Case for Classicism, uh, because Lovecraft coming upon, you know, coming after his great devotion to the classics, encountered a professor at that time in this amateur movement who said, oh, oh well, you don't need to read the classics, just read the contemporary stuff. That's, that's more relevant to today. And Lovecraft said, uh, no, <laughs> that's not right. He, what, he, what he said is this. The literary genius of Greece and Rome developed under peculiarly favorable circumstances may fairly be said to have completed the art and science of expression. Unhurried and profound, the classical author achieved a standard of simplicity, moderation, and elegance of taste, which all succeeding time has been powerless to excel or even to equal. Indeed, these moder those modern periods have been most cultivated in which the models of antiquity have been most faithfully followed. Now that's kind of an extreme statement, but you know, anyone who reads uh, the classic uh, authors in the original languages has some sense of what Lovecraft is talking about. I remember when I first came upon, you know, uh, reading Homer in, in Greek and reading Virgil in Latin, I, I was totally blown away. I mean, you, you really get a sense that this is some sort of apex of human expression. Uh, so I can see what Lovecraft is getting at, even though I don't quite uh, quite agree with him. And he himself modified his views later on, uh, but he was a, a, a devoted classicist. Um, the chief way, at least, uh, in, 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 in how Lovecraft was influenced by the classic, I believe, was in his philosophy. In the course of time, and in fact, even beginning fairly early as a teenager, he declared himself an atheist and a materialist, a philosophical materialist. I am quite convinced that, that some of these views, at least, were inspired by his reading of ancient philosophy, uh, especially the atomism of Democritus. Uh, and the, the, the modified atomism of Epicurus and Lucretius. Now, quite frankly, I think it is unlikely that he read the fragments of, of um, uh, Democritus and Epicurus in the Greek. He probably wasn't, his Greek just wasn't good enough uh, to do that. Uh, those texts were available, but he probably couldn't read them. Um, but he had a lot of books about uh, ancient philosophy in his library, and I'm sure he soaked up enough information from them. And he was actually very conversant with Lucretius. Uh, that was a Latin text that he could read pretty easily. In fact, he says that uh, that at the age of 12, he really was was a uh, uh, an atheist, and <laughs> was uh, uh, enrolled in Sunday school by his mother. His mother was a Baptist and wanted him to learn at least the rudiments of Christianity. And uh, uh, unfortunately, he uh, asked all sorts of probing questions to the to the teacher there, and, and she didn't know how to answer them. So he was asked to leave, uh, shall we say? Uh, <laughs> he was kind of proving to be a nuisance. Um, so. Uh, but I'm, I'm convinced that 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 classic philosophy laid the groundwork for his uh, later atheism and materialism. Now, of course, Lovecraft later on uh, learned uh, a lot about the sciences. Unusually for a creative writer, he was very well versed in the sciences, particularly chemistry, astronomy, uh, and others. And he followed the developments of 19th century science. Uh, theory of evolution, uh, development in astrophysics and things like that um, throughout his life. And so that was that was the foundation for his uh, uh, philosophical view, but, but the classical influence was there also. What this led to was um, um, uh, it, the literary expression of this philosophy was what he called cosmicism. Now, what that meant was that 
given the fact that human that that uh, that the human beings uh, are dwelling in this vast uh, uh, cosmos largely unknowable outside of our little sphere uh, a cosmos that is both infinite in time and in space human beings simply have no no relevance we are simply not important to the universe and that is what the bulk of his uh creative writing is meant to express and that and i believe he expresses that about as powerfully as as any writer uh who has ever written on that subject um i'll get into that, that later but even this view i think was derived in part uh, by his study of, of the ancients or at least uh, uh, by some sort of analogy let me let me read you a charming quotation he wrote around 1920 in a letter he says success is a relative thing and the victory of a boy at marbles is equal to the victory of an Octavius at Actium when measured by the scale of cosmic infinity. Now for all you people out there who don't know what the Battle of Actium is in 31 BC, well, that basically put an end to the Roman Republic and started the Roman Empire. So that was, it was like a watershed moment in, in, in Western history. Um, but even there, he drew upon a classical analogy to get that point across of, of human insignificance. Um, let me go on to talk about Lovecraft's uh, creative work. Now, he wrote a lot of poetry and essays and, and fiction. The poetry is indeed classically influenced, but quite frankly, it is, it, it's not, a, not a, a shining light amongst his work. He was not a very good poet. He mostly wrote imitations of the 18th century poets, in some cases, uh, reflecting all the way back to the ancients. He wrote several attempts to sort of uh, create new uh, uh, elements or, or new segments of Ovid's metamorphoses, for example, uh, things like that. But th the poetry doesn't really amount to much. The fiction does, of course, uh, and he, today he is now best known as a fiction writer. Uh, I'm going to draw attention to an early story called The Tree in 1921. The Tree is entirely based in ancient Greece. Now, Lovecraft is not specific about the details of the story but if you if you know enough history uh, of that era you can tell that it is set basically in the fourth century bce uh, in the provincial town of syracuse in sicily and um it deals with two artists one of whom kills the other uh, but is then uh, supernaturally avenged by by a tree uh, which justifies the epigraph that lovecraft place at the head of that story, uh, Fata Viam in Venient from, from Virgil's Aeneid, the fates will find a way. Uh, they did find a way to avenge the death of that artist. The Tree is one of several stories that Lovecraft wrote under the inspiration of Lord Dunsany. When he came upon Dunsany in 1919, he was completely blown away by this, this, this great writer. Um, uh, and I think he recognized, uh, he saw immediately that Dunsany himself was influenced by, by classical civilization, just as he had been. And that's, that was certainly part of his uh, uh, interest in Dunsany. Um, a few years later, he wrote a whole novel that in, in part inspired by Dunsany. This is called The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. It was written in 1926, uh, 1927, remained unpublished in Lovecraft's lifetime until after, his, uh, and wasn't published until after his death. This really is the summit of Lovecraft's, uh, 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 I wouldn't even call it imitation, uh, inspiration from Dunsany. What we have here is a man, Randolph Carter, roughly a stand-in for Lovecraft, who is seeking to uh, find the gods upon Kadath to, to uh, 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 make a plea for them. He wants them to restore this sunset city, as he calls it, that has been in his dreams, uh, but he can't find it anymore. Uh, and so he must make it a, a, a direct appeal, appeal to the gods upon Kadath. Now, clearly the framework of this story uh, is uh, uh, adapted from, from uh, the possibility of, of, of a human going up to scaling Mount Olympus uh, and making a plea directly to the gods upon Mount Olympus. The problem with, the, with Mr. Carter's quest here is that nobody knows where Kadath is. Uh, he enters the dreamland. It appears to be a sort of a collective dreamland that we can all enter into if we are properly uh, attuned to it. Um, and so uh, he learns from somebody else, you know, you ought to go to this place called Mount Negronek. Uh, I don't know how that's pronounced. It's spelled N-G-R-A-N-E-K, whatever. Uh, and he said, you know, there's a face upon carved upon Mount Negronic that shows the image of a god. And, and, uh, and this is what the narrator says of that, of that uh, image. It is known that in disguise, the younger among the great ones, that was the gods of, of, upon Kadath, often espouse the daughters of men, so that around the borders of the cold waste wherein stands Kadath, 
the peasants must all bear their blood. So here, clearly, Lovecraft's adapting the many, many Greek uh, uh, myths that that uh, spoke of, of of unions between uh, gods and and human beings that led to the birth of Hercules or Aeneas or Achilles or any of the great heroes uh, in Greek and, and and Roman myth. Um, so that whole novel really is structured upon upon Greek myth. Um, of course, the famous uh, the works for which Lovecraft is most famous for. Uh, is, is what has come to be called the Clulu mythos. The Clulu mythos, uh, the term is not, in, was not Lovecraft's term, by the way, it was come up uh, after his death, but uh, let's just use it anyway, uh, is a series of tales written mostly in the later, later decade of his life, um, in which the idea is that various gods, so-called, have come to the earth and, and you know, caused, caused some ruckus uh, and, and human beings unfortunate enough to meet them have had their minds blasted and all this sort of thing now you can say well how can lovecraft as an atheist come up with these gods well they're not gods uh, in the first place they are in the stories themselves portrayed as merely as space aliens uh from from the depths of space um lovecraft actually was a pretty good anthropologist uh he had read fraser's golden bow and other works of that kind and uh he knew of the intrinsic myth-making uh, faculty of human beings. When we encounter some force or entity that is vastly superior to us in power or, or uh, whatever, we attribute godlike properties to that entity. And that's what, that's what uh, the, the human worshipers of these gods are doing in his stories. In addition, um, on a more symbolic level, these, these gods in, in the stories are symbolic of the vastness and unknowability of the universe and the consequent in, insignificance. Uh, of the human race. Um, one of the ways though in which in the stories Lovecraft created uh, a, a verisimilitude was to create a whole library of occult or forbidden books uh, in which uh, information about these so-called gods can appear. And of course the most famous of these is the Necronomicon. Um, the Necronomicon, well, uh, in, in the stories, it is said, okay, it was first written in Arabic under the title Al-Azif. Uh, I won't go into what that means, but uh, Al-Azif uh, by the mad Arab Abdul Al-Hazred in the 8th century in, in Damascus. A few, a few centuries later, around the 10th, 11th century, it was translated into Greek under the title Necronomicon, subsequently translated into Latin, English, and, and so on. Necronomicon is Lovecraft's coinage. I mean, it is a word he has added to the Greek language, I suppose, if you want to think of it that way. Um, probably it was derived, I mean, he probably got it from, uh, by analogy, with Astronomica. Astronomica was a, uh, an astrological work uh, written by Marcus Manilius in Latin um, in the early first century uh, CE, I believe. Um, uh, Lovecraft didn't have much regard for that work because he, as an astronomer, he, he despised astrology, and, but, but the title probably intrigued him. Uh, so Necronomicon is a good coinage. However, Lovecraft didn't know Greek very well, as I mentioned. And so when he tried to define what this word meant uh, by the rules of Greek etymology, he was, I'm sorry to say, way, way off. I mean, he was way off. What he thought the word meant was image or picture of the laws of the dead. I won't go into how far off that is, but it's way off. I mean, <laughs> what that word really means is simply something that examines or classifies the dead. But that doesn't matter. Uh, what Lovecraft thought it meant is, is of some interest. Um, but as, as many of you know, the Necronomicon itself has kind of taken on a life of its own well outside of Lovecraft's fiction. It gets referred to all the time in weird contexts, like, like The Simpsons, at least uh, two different episodes of The Simpsons, I believe, drop the Necronomicon there. Uh, films like The Evil Dead uh, drop that name. There are several whole books that are purport to be the Necronomicon. They're all hoaxes, of course, although I think one guy took himself quite seriously in, in thinking he was actually writing the Necronomicon, but he was an occultist nut, and we don't need to take, take notice of him. But uh, so people have probably heard of the Necronomicon and probably don't even realize that, uh, that um, uh, it actually comes from, from the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, but uh, classical uh, elements in Lovecraft's fiction are, are numerous. Um, I, I, there's one story called the Dunwich Horror, famous story, uh, in which a, a, a the monster, if you will, uh, Wilbur Waitley, uh, turns out to be a sort of a, a amalgam of, of, of 
creatures, uh, he's sort of a hybrid creature. Uh, and I think Lefebvre is clearly thinking of the chimera there who is, let's see, what is it, part, what is it, part, uh, Lion part, goat part, something else. Anyway, uh, a tripartite monster like like uh, 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 the Chimera. Um, there are many, many other places in Lovecraft's fiction where where those kinds of allusions or, or uh, uh, implications are made. And yet, there's one very striking case uh, of direct Roman influence, uh, uh, Roman literature influence upon Lovecraft. Let's go back to Halloween of 1927 exactly how many 90, 90, 96 years ago right um 94 years ago lovecraft had a dream about being back in roman times um let me see the details um he imagined himself to be one um lucius caelius rufus he, he himself thought he was a roman uh, and he is in the province of, uh, of Spain, uh, Hispania Caterior, uh, in the town of Pompelo. That's the modern Pompelona, I believe. Um, he is there with uh, a contingent of the Roman army, and, and they're there because there's something strange going on up in the hills. There's, the, there's, there's some creatures called the Miri Nigri, uh, the strange dark folk who are planning something. They, they appear to worship God called the Magnum in Nominandum, uh, the great not to be named. Uh, nobody knows what this is, but uh, there's something something very strange going on. And Lovecraft has this elaborate dream, kind of like Lucian Taylor in The Hill of, Dream, in, in, in the Hill of Dreams, uh, where he is, is, you know, spends days or weeks uh, in this environment and, and you know, a uh, cataclysm occurs. I won't, I won't spoil the thing for you. But um, he wrote out this dream to several different correspondents. We have at least three different versions of it, uh, all slightly differing in, in little particulars, but uh, basically telling the same story. Um, and so several people said, hey, Lovecraft, you got to write this up into an actual story. And Lovecraft said, yeah, okay, maybe I'll do that someday. Well, he never did. Uh, so around 1930, a, a young friend of his who was, had received one of these uh, accounts in, in a letter, Frank Belknap Long, said, Lovecraft, I'd like to use this thing in a, story, in, a, in a novel I'm writing, uh, it's called The Horror from the Hills. And Lafayette said, yeah, sure. Um, so he actually, Long actually incorporated verbatim uh, the, <laughs> Uh, the text of, his, of this letter from Lovecraft, you know, went, which went on for three or 4,000 words, right into a, a chapter of his novel. Uh, and that got published in 1931. And it's, it's out there. You can, you can find it pretty easily. Um, uh, I'm not entirely sure that that dream account really fits into the novel, but it, it's kind of charming anyway. Uh, and, and one can make the case that, that Long was inspired by this dream to come up with this whole novel, even though it, it doesn't really fit. Um, uh, Lovecraft says he was inspired to, buy, to, to have this dream not only by the Halloween season, but by reading uh, a, a new translation that had come out of Virgil's Aeneid. This was by James Rhodes, R-H-O-A-D-E-S. James Rhodes wrote a good, good verse translation of the Aeneid in 1921. Uh, I don't know uh, how many other verse translations there had been you know, after Dryden's, uh, which Lovecraft also loved. Uh, but it was a good, good translation, uh, and, and Lovecraft clearly was inspired by it because he just loved, especially that, that famous sixth book uh, where, where uh, Aeneas goes down to the underworld, meets his father and, and Anchises, and Anchises gives this uh, famous speech about the, 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 the future glory of Rome. Uh, that, was, that was a big thing for Lovecraft. Um, so, again, the depth of detail that, that Lovecraft recounts in this dream shows to what extent Lovecraft really had uh, imbibed uh, uh, Greek, Greek and Roman civilization. Um, uh, I could go on a lot more about Lovecraft, but if I may, let me, let me introduce a personal note. I've said that I myself am, am uh, or once was a student of the classics. Even that came through Lovecraft, and I'll tell you how. I latched on to Lovecraft when I was about 14, 15, let's say. And right from the beginning, I not, not only wanted to read Lovecraft, but I wanted to study him. And I felt that there was more work to be done on this writer. And I also wanted to elevate him in the, in the eyes of, of uh, the general public because I felt he was being undervalued. So even in, in, in high school, I was trying to do you know, some minimal scholarship on Lovecraft, and I discovered that uh, a lot of Lovecraft's papers had ended up at Brown University because you know, is he lived right there in Providence. 
um, and his literary executor had donated the papers after his death to, to the Brown University Library. So I said, I got to go there, you know, all these papers, manuscripts, books, and whatnot. So I went to this great Ivy League institution. <laughs> I got in, luckily, not because it's a great institution of higher learning, although it is, of course, but because of Lovecraft. Um, but when I got there, I said, you know, Lovecraft had this great interest in the classics, and I know next to nothing about the classics. I, I, I wanted to get further into Lovecraft's mind, uh, and, and I had this, I, the way to do that is to learn about the classics myself, uh, because nobody else was doing this sort of thing. Uh, nobody out there knew, knew Latin and Greek in the Lovecraft community, so I said, well, <laughs> I better learn it. Um, but in the course of learning Latin and Greek and ancient history and ancient philosophy uh, and, and whatnot, those fields became of profound interest in their own right to me. Uh, and so I started specializing in ancient philosophy specifically, uh, whether it be the pre-Socratics, the uh, Democritus and others, uh, and, uh, but especially uh, Epicurus and Lucretius. I wrote a master's thesis on Lucretius uh, at Brown and then went to Princeton uh, for a PhD in classical philosophy. But, at some point, I decided that I, I didn't want to remain in the uh, in the classical world, um, at least not in the uh, in the academic environment. I felt I didn't really really fit in there, uh, so I left there without a PhD and and, and went into publishing. Uh, but I'll tell you, I have not regretted one moment of my of my learning of, of, of classical uh, culture. It has enriched my life to this very day. Um, in fact, after now. <laughs> 30 years or more of being apart from it, I'm now uh, drawing upon it again because I have embarked on a new project. It'll take several years. It is nothing less than a world history of atheism. Uh, and I'll tell you, if I had not learned about ancient philosophy from some of the great professors I studied with at Brown and Princeton, uh, Michael C.J. Putnam and Kurt Rafflaub and, 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 and David Furley and, and Michael Freda and many others, uh, there's no way I could have done done, done uh, the chapters on, on on Greece and Rome in this book. Uh, you have to have expert uh, education on this stuff. It's not something you can learn on your own. So I I am profoundly grateful for for that knowledge. But even so, that came directly or indirectly from Lovecraft. One of one of Lovecraft's friends, Robert Bloch, uh, the writer who went on to write Psycho and and other great works of, of horror fiction. He corresponded with Lovecraft for about four years when he was you know, late teenager into his, into his early 20s. And he said, Lovecraft was my university. And what he meant by that was that, that Bloch, who did not in fact go to college, learned so much about all different kinds of things just from Lovecraft's letters. They opened up so many different avenues of inquiry uh, 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 that he would not have known otherwise, that he felt he was actually sort of attending a university and being tutored by this, this, this great, uh, great educator uh, named H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, now I, who have been to university, feel in much the same way because Lovecraft has taken me off in all kinds of directions that I that I probably would not have explored myself. And, and the classics was one of them. Uh, I had had some rudimentary interest in the classics uh, before that, but not much. But once I got into it, I said, wow, this is an incredible discipline. And, and it's something that we all ought to learn um, because it has structured so much of, 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 of the life uh, of, of Western civilization. Uh, and so I, I tell you, I am, I am profoundly grateful for uh, for Lovecraft for leading me into this uh, into this direction, and for my professors and 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 uh, whoever else has have helped me to become uh, uh, educated in the classics. That's 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 about it. Great. Well, thank you so much, St. I think we have uh, some time for some questions, which is great. Uh, your presentation was extremely erudite and informative. Thank you so much. Uh, so one question that immediately came up in my mind was thinking about some of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's, shall we say, friends or colleagues in the weird fiction uh, universe of the 1920s and 30s. And, and one uh, classicist, shall we say, is Robert E. Howard from Texas. How did Lovecraft, because, you know, Robert E. Howard, to my understanding, couldn't fit his Conan stories into actual ancient history. So he created Hyporia, this, this kind of pre-historical time. How did Lovecraft receive uh, Robert Howard's stories? And, and uh, did, did Lovecraft like uh, build upon that pre-historical time or did he want uh, Robert E. Howard to stick in a more classical historical fiction mold? 
Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> he, he had some very fruitful arguments with Robert E. Howard over the course of a six-year correspondence. It was, it was an enormous correspondence. It fills two volumes. I published it uh, from both sides. It's, it's an enormous uh, uh, body, of, uh, body of text. What he found about Howard is that Howard, because of his upbringing in, in Texas at a time when Texas was still kind of a frontier uh, state, if you will, uh, really look to that kind of, of, of environment as the ideal state for humanity. Uh, he, he championed barbarism over civilization. I mean, that's, that's a simplistic uh, uh, formulation, but it, it basically that's, that's what he did. And of course, Lovecraft is the, the polar, polar opposite, uh, you know, raised in, in, in the, uh, uh, the civilized East, uh, didn't care for, uh, for uh, you know, the, the, the kind of rudimentary life that you have as a, as a pioneer. Uh, so they had all these arguments about about you know the ideal state of existence, and and Lovecraft knew that um, that that Howard in his fiction actually wrote a whole series of stories set in Roman Britain, but he took the side, of course, of the Britons or the Picts against the Romans, and and that actually deeply offended Lovecraft <laughs> because he says, you know, when I cast my mind back into into uh, that era, I have to look at it through Roman eyes, and so. <laughs> He found these stories really hard to read because they 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 they, they portrayed Romans as the villains and the and the and the, the Britons and the Picts as the uh, as the good guys. So they had they had endless arguments about that. Um, and in terms of, of Robert E. Howard's other creations like Hy Hyboria and also the realm of Valusia, uh, another ancient land, uh, Lovecraft felt that Howard wasn't being as historically accurate as he could have been. Uh, Howard simply didn't care about that. He was writing pure, pure fantasy to his mind. And even though some of his names and terms kind of look sound ancient or sound Greek or Roman, they're, they're not meant to be. And, and that kind of uh, irritated Lovecraft also. So, but so, so Lovecraft kept, kept badgering Howard about that, but it, it had no influence on him. Sure. So we have a question from the live chat. Uh, and the, the question says, although the larger Gnostic corpus, this is referring, I believe, to uh, the Nag Hammadi, wasn't uncovered until 1945, some Gnostic stories were known in Lovecraft's day. Did he ever read or credit Gnostic myths, deities, uh, and any influence on his own mythos? So we might even extend that to um, other kind of occultic beliefs that existed in pre-Christian or early Christian Europe. Yeah, certainly. I actually don't know a great deal about the Gnostics myself. Um, the person you should ask is Robert M. Price, who is a, yeah. a leading scholar uh, on, on the New Testament and, and also a devoted Lovecraftian. Um, but yeah, uh, this the mythos that Lovecraft created is certainly a, an amalgam of various different things, just as Dunsany's uh, Pagana thing is, because Dunsany also drew upon Near Eastern myth, uh, uh, Asian myth, and, and a number of other things. Um, Lovecraft was not well versed in traditional occultism because as a materialist and as, a, as an atheist, he felt that was all bunk. Mm. He found it interesting for imaginative purposes. Uh, for example, he read the novel, or the, the non, so-called nonfiction of Charles Fort um, uh, just for fun. He thought there might be some stuff that he can get out of there for, for fictional purposes, but he didn't buy what Fort was getting at. And, and he thought most occultism uh, was just just not interesting enough, um, and he preferred to uh, uh, create his own myth rather than being tied to some pre-existing uh, myth or folklore. Uh, so um, I, I don't know that that there's a, a profound Gnostic influence on Lovecraft because I don't think he really he knew much about it. Okay, great. Um, one of Lovecraft's most famous stories, uh, a story I haven't read in a few years, so forgive me if I forget some of the the new details is the call of Cthulhu, uh, where the main character's uncle is a semeticist at Brown. Uh, am I or is his oh, grandfather? Yes. Yeah, professor, call him a professor of Semitic languages. Yes, yeah. professor of Semitic languages at Brown. Uh, how much was uh, Lovecraft's, shall we say, understanding of Semitics, understanding of ancient Near East history? Uh, was it well developed or, or was he kind of just taking various ideas that were popular at the time and just incorporating them into his stories? Yeah, I, I again, I don't think Lovecraft was all that well versed. In fact, I'm not even sure that there is or ever was 
a department of Semitic languages at Brown or anywhere else. Uh, um, I, I, by the way, briefly, I wanted to mention that Lovecraft really wanted to go to Brown, uh, but he didn't even graduate from high school. He mm -hmm. dropped out of high school after like three years. He had some sort of nervous breakdown. And he couldn't go to Brown. So that was deeply disappointing to him because he felt he was undereducated in, in a formal sense, although he picked up a lot from, from, from uh, self-education. Um, uh, but yeah, I think the term Semitic languages there refers to a, not just to Hebrew, but a whole concatenation of languages yeah. uh, that includes other languages in the Middle East. And I think that's what Lefrev was implying, again, uh, through this vehicle of the Necronomicon, which was written in Arabic. Uh, and I think that that was the connection there. Um, but again, uh, Lefrev didn't know Arabic, didn't know Hebrew. Uh, so he was just kind of winging it and, and kind of dropping these allusions just to, to pique the reader's interest. Sure. Does Miskatonic University have a classics department? Not that I know. He never mentions it. He has a medical school, of course. He, yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> Herbert West, the reanimator, uh, attended. But no, he, and, and of course, there's a, there's a, there's a philosophy department because uh, somebody studied metaphysics uh, at Miskatonic, but uh, no mention of classical, uh, classical uh, department. Great. So we have another question from the chat. Uh, a wonderful lecture on the inspiration uh, Lovecraft drew from antiquity. Thank you. A question. How would you characterize the difference of how Lovecraft incorporated Western traditions, ideas, history, and how he might have interacted if he did with the East? Or I think at that time it was it was called the Orient. Yeah, I mean, let's let's be honest. I mean, Lovecraft was writing at a stage uh, of, of history, and indeed through his own personal education, he would be called what we call a maybe pejoratively nowadays a, a Eurocentrist. Okay, fine, that, that's just the way he was. And, and that's how many people were in that, in that, in that society. Uh, so to that extent, uh, even things like the, what, what we call the Middle East or the Near East, uh, and certainly the Far East uh, were exotic. Uh, they, were, they were alien, if you want to call it that. Um, and, but in that sense, they made interesting fodder for weird fiction because weird fiction is based upon the unknown, uh, the alien, the 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 these things that that we don't quite understand, and so. Uh, but Lovecraft really cosmicized that notion. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, even though this Necronomicon was supposed to be written in Arabic, uh, uh, Lovecraft is uh, pointedly tells you in this little thing he wrote that that the author was an indifferent Muslim. Uh, he was actually, in fact, a heretic. He was not a Muslim. He was actually a, a devotee of Lulu and Yog Sothoth and all these other gods. Uh, so to that extent, uh, Lovecraft is saying, well, OK, uh, we're in a foreign land, but we're also, uh, you know, uh, out there in the universe as well. And so we are nothing and the universe is everything. And, and that's what these these occult books are meant to convey. And uh, a good transition. You mentioned some of these names. And uh, I think for many people, uh, the fun in Lovecraft is trying to pronounce uh, the variety of names uh, or the variety of words that are occasionally incantated from the Necronomicon. Where is the source of names like uh, Yogg-Sogoth or, or uh, we, we touched a little bit about Necronomicon, but Cthulhu and, uh, oh, I'd say, I, again, some of the other names are just, yeah. even, even I can't uh, properly pronounce them. Yeah, well, I'm not sure anybody can uh, because... <laughs> Uh, well, actually, Lovecraft in one late letter does tell you very specifically, you, even using phonetics, uh, uh, you know, diacritical critical marks and everything, how to pronounce clue-lu, clue-lu. It's two syllables. Sure. The, the T, C-T-A, the T-H is not really a T-H. It's kind of like a harsh L sound. It's clue-lu because there's another story um, uh, where a variant term is used Tulu, T-U-L-U. So um, that's sort of how it's meant to be pronounced. But actually, Lovecraft admitted, you know, it's a totally alien term. It's not even human. So human vocal cords can't possibly pronounce it. He said he spent a lot of time trying to come up with something that was completely non-human. And he seems to have done the trick here. The other terms that he uses, like Yog sothoth is, is alien to some degree, but it is filtered through Arabic. Mm -hmm. because it, that term has a number of analogies to certain Arabic words. Uh, so does his so-called sort of the, 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 the chief god of his pantheon, if you want to call it that, is Azathoth. And there's clearly uh, an Arabic ring to that. 
uh, Nyarlathotep, which I actually I think I'm mispronouncing, but no matter. Um, that's clearly Egyptian. Uh, Hotep is an Egyptian root, and Nyarlat may be Egyptian. Also, I, I can't remember. Some people have done some some uh, attempted derivations of that. But aside from Klulu, we actually don't really know how Lovecraft pronounces the mm. words. Um, there's a, there's a, you know, he, he came up with a, with a planet, which he identified with Pluto as Yugath. And we think that is how it's pronounced because it appears in verse uh, and you're forced by the meter to pronounce it as Yugath, not Yugoth or whatever. Um, but otherwise, we don't really know. Um, uh, Lovecraft's friends sometimes tell you, you know, oh yeah, they, they wrote memoirs of Lovecraft. So, oh yeah, he pronounced it this way, but uh, some of those things aren't, aren't reliable. So in some, most cases, we don't know. Sure. What was uh, Lovecraft's writing process for his one uh, kind of ancient Egypt story on, under the pyramids, correct? Which was kind of <laughs> yes. pseudonymously written with um, Harry Houdini. Yes, that, that's very funny. Um, okay. Late 1923, Weird Tales, the magazine Weird Tales, where Lovecraft was publishing a lot of his stories, uh, was in deep financial trouble. Uh, and so they brought in uh, Harry Houdini as a kind of a, you know, guest star, in, in, in a sense, to, uh, to bolster the, uh, the uh, popularity of the magazine. Uh, you know, Houdini had been around for 20 years or more as, a, as an escape artist. And also, by the way, as a, as a uh, debunker of superstition and, and spiritualism, that was a big thing with him. And in fact, he wrote a book on that subject that he gave to Lovecraft. Um, anyway, um, so at some point, uh, early 1924, the, the publisher of Weird Tales um, said, Lovecraft, uh, we want you to write up this account that Houdini claims actually to have had in Egypt where he descended into the, the bowels of one of the pyramids and all sorts of weird things happen. Um, and, and so Lovecraft said, yeah, sure. Uh, but as he himself studied uh, uh, Houdini's account and, and, and matched it up with what he himself knew about you know, the pyramids, Lovecraft said, this is all bunk. I mean, this is complete fiction. There's no way this could have happened. Uh, so he pleaded with the, the publisher, uh, let, let me have a free hand with this. Let me just write out of my imagination, you know, basic, it, based it in, in Egypt. Uh, and he did so. Uh, and, and that appeared, it appeared under the title Imprisoned with the Pharaohs, but we, we know from documentation that, that Lovecraft titled it Under the Pyramids. Um, it was to have appeared in Weird Tales as a joint byline, you know, by Harry Houdini and H.P. Lovecraft. But the publisher, when he saw this manuscript, said, oh, it's written in the first person, you know, as if by Houdini. And, and the guy couldn't wrap his mind around how a first person account could be jointly, jointly bylined. So he left <laughs> yeah, Lovecraft's yeah. name off. And uh, only after Lovecraft's death, the magazine reprinted the story and said, oh, by the way, H.P. Lovecraft wrote this story. So that's how that came to be. Fantastic. We have uh, one more question from the chat. Um, brilliant talk, many thanks. ST, here is my question. What was the dynamic in uh, Lovecraft's perception of fun day, uh, uh, was it Salik literature, modernist literature, the early 20th century, which itself was heavily influenced by ancient philosophy and mysticism? Uh... Not sure what that's referring to exactly. Uh, potentially, um, the works T.S. Eliot was heavily influenced uh, by. Oh, okay, okay, modern. All right. Well, oh, Lovecraft. I, I could go on a lot on this subject. There have been some major papers written on this Lovecraft and the modernists. Generally speaking, Lovecraft didn't like them. Let me just put it bluntly that way. <laughs> when when Eliot came out with the Wasteland, Lovecraft actually read it in magazine form in in the Dial. Uh, in November 1922, and he was like totally flummoxed by it. He, he couldn't make head or tail of it. Uh, and so, because it so violated his canons of, of coherence and, and, and logical order, you know, that he had derived from, from, from classical literature, uh, he ended up writing a parody of it. It's, it's brilliant. It's called Waste Paper. <laughs> it is it's, it's a hill, riotously funny. Uh, a poem that parodies uh, Eliot. Uh, it's still extant. It's it's in his collected poems as as I as I edited them, um, and yet, you know, he also understood. This was a time when the early twenties, when he was you know modifying his classicism, uh, 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 realizing that that literature had to be a little more contemporary. You couldn't just reflect attitudes of you know two centuries or two millennia ago. Uh, and so Lovecraft was sort of dragging himself <laughs> slowly into the modern world. 
uh, and actually spoke highly of things like like Ulysses, although I don't think he actually read Ulysses, but he felt it was a brave venture uh, that was destroying, you know, that demolishing the 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 old nineteenth century uh, standards of literature, which Lovecraft despised. Um, sure. So so his view was very conflicted, but but uh, but. Uh, Throughout the rest of his life, he he had an ongoing sort of discussion with the modernists about what literature should be. And I know that H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, and I don't know how genuine this comment was, but he said Freud was puerile symbolism. Uh, but how was was H.P. Lovecraft at all influenced by uh, the the kind of the French symbolism or the European symbolism late nineteenth early twentieth century, which was filled with these kind of dream tales. Um, these kind of elaborate, uh, symbolic, shall we say, uh, journeys that characters would have that explore these, you know, sexual and uh, very uh, uh, detailed symbolic scenes? Uh, the short answer to that is probably no. However, uh, it, by the way, in terms of Freud, that comment does appear in a story. In, in a letter, he actually praises Freud for again knocking down some of the uh, the, 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 the the inhibitions of the 19th century and, and coming up with what he what may or may not be a truer account of human psychology. Uh, he preferred the 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 the, the, the psychology of, of uh, um, uh, Adler. What was his first name? Uh, Alfred Adler. Uh, he felt that was more true to uh, to, mm. uh, to life or to 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 science than than than, than Freud. Uh, largely because Adler was drawing upon Nietzsche. Lovecraft uh, was greatly influenced by, by Nietzsche in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the, the French symbolists, uh, probably not. He loved to go back to writers like Baudelaire, uh, mm. who was not really a symbolist, although he may have given birth to, to symbolism in some ways. Um, uh, one, one writer who did, was influenced by them was Clark Ashton Smith, uh, Lovecraft's mm. great friend for 15, 20 years, uh, both as a poet and maybe as, as a fiction writer. Uh, Smith indeed drew upon uh, Mallarmé and and, and uh, writers of that sort. Maybe maybe uh, Rambo as well, um, but I don't think I don't think Lovecraft really got into them. He's his knowledge of French also wasn't terribly good. He couldn't read French mm. in the original, um, uh, so he he you know. And I don't think that kind of literature really would have appealed to him. He did actually like uh, Joris Karl Huysmans. Um, who wrote these two great kind of pseudo horror novels uh, against the grain and Laba? Laba is all about the black mass. So love mm. that. One. But uh, aside from that, he he wasn't notably influenced by French literature. Sure. Uh, and then uh, another question: We talked about uh, Arthur uh, Machen's Mackin's discussion of uh, ancient Roman history. One one person wants to know: uh, Did Lovecraft and Mackin ever talk? Or ever have correspondence because they lived uh, you know, at the same time. They did live at the same time. Yeah, both Mackin and Dunsany, by the way, were born before Lovecraft and died after him. So Lovecraft's lifetime was kind of short. Um, no, Lovecraft, he, he was a very humble individual. He didn't really get to know, or I, I think he might have wanted to know these people, uh, but he was too uh, shy to write to them. Um, the only communication there was was indirect. For example. When Lovecraft wrote, uh, published a, a work called Supernatural Horror and Literature in a magazine, a, a kind of a historical account of, of the supernatural, uh, and talked a lot about both Mackin and Donsaney, uh, a friend of his, Donald Wandry, who somehow had gotten to know Mackin, sent this magazine to Mackin, and, and Mackin liked it, apparently. Um, uh, you know, spoke highly of him, of course, but uh, uh, in other ways, he liked it as well. Uh, but again, uh, Mack and Lovecraft did never had direct communication again, and they would have had a little difficulty because Mackin was a very devout uh, Anglo-Catholic and Lovecraft mm. was pretty much a pure atheist. That might have caused some, some dissension there. Dunsany is an even more interesting case. Um, he went to a lecture, Dun correct, in Boston? Yes. Lovecraft saw Dunsany in person. Uh, uh, Dunsany was giving a... a an extensive lecture tour in the United States in 1919 and 1920. He was a he was a he was a rock star at that time. I mean, he was hugely popular uh, both because of his fiction and because of his plays, uh, which were appearing on on Broadway and things like that. But uh, Dunsany went to Boston for the sole purpose of of seeing Lord Dunsany right there uh, give a talk. Um, but again, he was too too shy to to actually write a letter to him. However, this is very interesting. After Lovecraft's death. Uh, his pub, uh, Lovecraft's publisher, August Derleth, um, sent him 
uh, a book containing some of these stories that were inspired by Dunsany, and Dunsany liked them. He says, you know, this guy Lovecraft, he's not really imitating me. He's using my work as kind of a springboard for his own ideas, which indeed <laughs> is the exact case. So I, I thought that was very interesting to, to see how, how Dunsany responded to Lovecraft's own uh, take on Dunsany. Fantastic. And I think uh, we'll end with one last question. Uh, this has been uh, very informative and a lot of fun. So to my understanding, Lovecraft had a interesting political journey. Um, he, he expressed, I believe he called himself a Tory at one point, 1920s, but then towards the end of his life, he was a kind of staunch New Deal FDR type figure. Uh, was any of his politics, uh, anti-democratic or democratic, influenced by classical sources? I doubt it. Um, yeah, early on, he, he was extremely conservative, uh, but that was probably through familial influence. Uh, remember, you're talking about the 1890s, early, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. uh, New England, unlike now, was a very socially and politically conservative region. Uh, for a whole lot of reasons, uh, this was they felt they were the you know the founders of, of the nation you know John Adams and all those folks back in the uh, 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, and there was a lot of old money still there, Boston, mm -hmm. Providence, elsewhere. So that was a very conservative part of the area um, of the country, and so Lovecraft just I don't think he thought much about politics uh, in his early youth, and he just adopted those kinds of attitudes. And as he went along, though, especially in the course of the 1920s. He says, mm, something, something is not quite right here. And then what happens? The Great Depression. Uh, and right around then, Lovecraft starts thinking more deeply about issues of politics and economics and, 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 and social equity and things like that. And that's when he did what seems to be a remarkable turnaround and become uh, what he called a moderate socialist, by which he meant a non-Marxist socialist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a Scandinavian socialist by in, in today's parlance. Um, and yes, he, he was a great supporter of the New Deal, wanted the New Deal to go even farther to the left than, than, than it was going. Um, you know, uh, he spoke, spoke in highly abusive terms to about Republicans of that era. <laughs> it's most amusing uh, to read those, those comments. And he was delighted when Roosevelt won a massive uh, landslide victory in 1936. Uh, he died, of course, the next year, uh, Lovecraft did. But uh, yeah, I think this just came from from observation of the scene. Lovecraft really right. hadn't paid much attention to what was going on in society uh, until the Great Depression. And that really woke him up and said, mm. you know, we're, uh, th th there's something seriously wrong with capitalism. We got we got to do something different here. Great. Fantastic. Well, uh, S.T., thank you again for a, a very informative talk. I think you have elaborated the pertinence of the classical world to H.P. Lovecraft and weird fiction. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you for answering these questions. Do you have any final uh, words or any maybe final uh, places of interest that people can go to read about Lovecraft or read about Lovecraft and weird fiction in the ancient world? Um, there have been some papers written on this subject. They're, they're a little hard to find. They, they appear in, in some issues of a magazine that I edit uh, called the Lovecraft Annual. Uh, a number of fine pieces have been written on this subject. So you, uh, they're, they're, they're listed in the MLA bibliography. So if, you, if you're dis diligent about it, you can, you can hunt them out. Um, by the way, I should mention the best website for Lovecraft is simply called hblovecraft.com. No, no periods there, um, except the .com. Uh, run by uh, a man named Donovan Lauchs. Uh, he has a lot of information about Lovecraft there, maybe not specifically related to the classics, but a lot of other stuff that you would like to know about Lovecraft's life and writings and, and things like that. So that, that's a good place to start if you want to uh, uh, examine uh, the work of Lovecraft. Right. Well, thank you so much, JT. And thank you all who watched and who participated through their questions in this event. Uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day, uh, ST, and uh, thank you again for this presentation. Sure. It was great fun.